Thank you, Laura. The music today has added so much to uh, so much to Sabbath services. I'd like to thank Thomas and uh, Donna today for giving us a phone call and telling us Route 52 <laughs> was closed. There wasn't any signs anywhere telling us that, that we had to take a detour to get here. But everything's good. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Beautiful out today. You know, today at today at sunset, as the spring holy days comes to an end, probably for most of us, maybe we're looking forward to having that hamburger again, or maybe it's a chocolate-covered donut. We stopped at Sheets and they had all these donuts there. I don't particularly like donuts, but they, even they look good this morning. <laughs> or maybe just having that uh, having that slice of bread again. You know, the kind of bread that doesn't crumble if you try to spread butter on it. But, you know, maybe for some of us, we have mixed emotions. After doing all that work, getting the leavening out of our homes, you know, we hate, just hate to bring it back in again. Maybe some of us maybe feel a little guilty about bringing leavening back into our homes. Maybe we think about, like, bringing sin back into our, back into our homes, our lives. Today I'd like to go through five lessons we can learn from the spring holy days. And hopefully it'll answer a question maybe about feeling guilty about bringing the leavening back in. I realize there's many more lessons we can learn from the spring holy days than just five, but today I'd like to focus in on these five. Number one, number one, we have to get physical about the spiritual. We have to get physical about the spiritual. You know, in order for us to understand the spiritual aspects, we need to understand it in physical terms. You know, since we're all physical beings living in a physical world, often we need to relate spiritual matters in physical terms. And you know, that is the reason God wants us to enact these physical things like unleavened bread, you know, the wine, the foot washing, to help us to understand the spiritual. There's a much uh, misaligned scripture in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. In Colossians 2, 16, that tells us that the holy days are, are a shadow of the spiritual. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Colossians 2.16 Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of Christ. And notice the word is most translations is in italics showing that it was added by the translators. The body of Christ they're talking about is the church so this verse is saying that any judgment or clarifications that have to be made about these things are made by the church but the point I wanted to make are these shadows physical types of the spiritual and I, over the years I made this observation about shadows you know just using common sense if you're in the darkness you cannot perceive or see a shadow in order to have a shadow, you have to be in the light. And the stronger the light, the more precise, the better defined is the shadow. It would seem as long as we're in the light that the shadows will be there. But if you're in the darkness, then the shadows disappear. And when we think about the shadows, the, the clearest shadows, the most defined shadows are in focus when, when light is cast, when we're close to the light. So to understand the physical aspects of the holy, holy days most clearly, then we have to be close to the light, which means we're not out left in the darkness. And, we, and when we see these shadows, the physical most clearly, that is when we begin to grasp the spiritual. 
the spiritual, the light. So by understanding and rehearsing the physical part of the holy days, we can begin to understand the spiritual. And you know, we're told by God that we need to rehearse these holy days on an annual basis. I think God knew if it was up to us, there would be much confusion on the how often to observe these things. And, you know, human nature seems to operate on the extremes. You know, my wife says that I'm a person of extremes. I, I really don't know where she gets that idea. But, you know, if one stick of dynamite will blow up a tree stump, you just figure 18 would do a better job. <laughs> you know, God knew that if he left it up to us, some of us, we would do, be doing the holy days more often than others. And he knew if we, did not, if we did not do them often enough, that they would become so routine, or they would become routine, if we did them too often, they'd become so routine that they would lose their meaning. And if we didn't do them often enough, then we would forget the meaning. You know, we would lose focus, and we'd, we'd fade spiritually into the darkness. So God has decided that we should rehearse these holy days once a year, every year. You know, in order to understand getting the spiritual leavening out of our lives, you know, then that we should physically do certain physical things like wash one another's feet to understand the spiritual aspects of humility and being reconciled to our brothers and sisters. At the same time, forgiving our brothers and sisters. And at the same time, understanding, unless we're willing to forgive, you know, forgive others, forgive our brothers and sisters, then we cannot expect forgiveness from God, physically taking the bread and the wine. So to understand the spiritual sacrifice of Christ, knowing they're symbolized by his broken body and shed blood, you know, physically eating this unleavened bread, knowing we need to be partaking of the spiritual bread from heaven. So brethren, we do need to get physical about the spiritual. In order to understand the spiritual, we have to focus in on the, on the physical. Number two, saying goodbye to leavening is hard and it takes time. Saying goodbye to leavening is hard and it takes time. You know, even getting the physical landing out of our houses, out of our homes, is not an easy task. And it does take time. And you know, we're giving very specific instructions for the preparation for the spring holy days. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. Exodus 12, verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day that person shall be cut off from Israel. And we know from this instruction and other instructions that were given that the first day of un by the first day of unleavened bread, all leavening was supposed to be removed from our homes. And this process of de-leavening was very, very much a property symbolic of the spiritual meaning of these instructions. And I know for myself, I found out rather early in my church experience how difficult it can be to get the physical leavening out of the house. You know, my first attempt at keeping the days of unleavened bread, after I thought that all the leavening had been cleaned up, I told you before that how the bag and the vacuum cleaner had uh, ruptured and spewed this leavening all over the house again. Just had to start all over again. And later on that day in attempting to burn the leavening in an old tar bucket, that this residual tar in the bucket exploded. And again, the leavening went everywhere. The leavening that just refused to go away that year. 
But this experience, I learned from this experience how hard it was to get the, even the physical leavening out of the home. In spite of all these things that did go wrong, this experience of trying to get rid of the leavening, it helped me to realize that sin is like, like this leavening is very difficult. It's very difficult to get rid of. And it helps us to better understand the spiritual. And Paul made a con uh, comparison in 1 Corinthians 5. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 5, here Paul compares leavening with sin. He brings this out, this analogy out in 1 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed, our, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. And you know, after actually going through this process of getting rid of the leavening, it helps us to... I don't think we'd understand because most people in this world do not understand what Paul is talking about here. It helps us to understand what Paul is really talking about. That, you know, sin is also very difficult to deal with. It's hard to get rid of and we, need, and we do need help. Paul again ties in the preparation of the Passover with the taking of the Passover itself. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, we're told here in 1 Corinthians 11 that we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves before taking the Passover. Again, referring back to the Passover preparation. Verse 28, 1 Corinthians 11. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You know, since we're to examine ourselves before the Passover to see whether we're worthy to take it, and what he's talking about being worthy to take the Passover is whether we're able to see our sins and be able to repent of those sins, to have that spirit of repentance and we're told to examine ourselves. What better time than when we're getting rid of the leavening in our homes to examine ourselves, to examine our spiritual lives also. You know, when we're going through this symbolism and examining our homes, our possessions for this unleavened bread, you know, we, we realize at this point, we should realize at this point that God does know what he's doing. That this is really an effective time to do this examination in our lives, looking for this leavening. You know, when we reenact the physical, when we do that, God is able, he's able at that point to reveal the spiritual. And the better, the more in focus we see the shadow, the stronger, the clearer the light. And one of the most profound spiritual illustrations for me was one year when I was de the car And I was down. I was down cleaning the carpet, cleaning the carpet in the car. I was kind of laying down in the in the front seat with my head almost down on the carpet, right down there at eye level. And as I vacuumed, I could see all these little particles jumping up out of the out of the carpet. As this vacuum cleaner went across the carpet, and I don't know if these particles were leavening or not, but but I could see them as just little microscopic pieces of leavening down there, these little breadcrumbs. And every time, every time I'd run that vacuum cleaner over the carpet, more of these particles would appear. No matter how many times I ran that vacuum cleaner across that carpet, they just kept appearing, more particles. It made me realize the closer you look, the more you're going to see. And I realized it would take a miracle it would take a miracle to get rid of every one of those little particles down to the microscopic level. And since then, I've read that no matter where we are, we've got these yeast particles all 
floating around in the air that we're never going to get rid of all of them. We cannot get rid of all of those by ourselves. You know, by following God's instruction book, doing this physical act of trying to remove the leavening, it really does show us, it does take a miracle to completely rid of us, rid us of sin, the leavening in our lives. Spiritually, it takes a miracle for us to clean out the sin. It is not something that we can do entirely by ourselves. Even though it does take a miracle, God expects us to do our part. It makes us realize that we have a part to play. We have to be a doer to examine our, uh, our homes physically, at the same time examine our lives spiritually. Examine them in the light of God's word. It reminds me of a, a scripture in the book of James. Let's look over in James chapter 1. <clears throat> James chapter 1. <clears throat> and here James talks about the importance, the importance of being a doer. James chapter 1 verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You know, brethren, as we examine ourselves in that mirror of God's word, we're usually able to sp maybe to spot some of the, the flaws and blemishes. But just like trying to get rid of every last bit of leavening in our homes, there's no way we can remove those spots and blemishes. Brethren, it takes a miracle. It takes a miracle to do that. It takes a miracle to wash us clean to complete the deleavening process. And I think we would have to admit from the physical example of trying to move the leavening, remove the leavening from our homes, that the spiritual idea of getting leavening out of our out of our lives, the sin out of our lives, is also difficult and it does take time. Which brings us to the third point. The third point, the Passover is too expensive. The Passover is too expensive. You know, when we look at the spiritual meaning of the Passover, we have to realize, we have to realize that it's too expensive. None of us, none of us can afford the price. In order for us to partake of that, it has, we have to, it has to be a gift. You know, there are quite a few churches that observe part of the Passover. They don't fool with the Passover preparation. And the only part they really take part in is uh, usually the bread and the wine. And many of those who observe the Passover begin with the bread and the wine. But they've already passed over the first step, the preparation. And for those who leave out the first part, they really don't have a clue because they've ignored the instruction book. Let's go to Leviticus 23. In Leviticus 23, the Bible tells us when we should actually observe this. Leviticus 23. And it also tells us who it belongs to. Leviticus 23, verse 4. These are the feast of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Notice who appoints these times, not us. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And when we look at the first step in the, in the Passover, in the actual Passover ceremonies, it is a step that most leave out. The first step of the Passover ceremony, according to God's instruction book, is something that people feel that's 
maybe strange or outdated, obsolete. And that is the foot washing. And you know, as we wash that person's feet, we're supposed to think of the symbolism of what we're doing. You know, just as we did in the Passover preparation, you know, when we examine our homes for leavening, we examine our lives for sin. Today, just for a few minutes, I would like to, I'd like to imagine, for you to imagine yourself living back in the, in the first century, a time when Rome ruled the world. And you'd be living in a society that would seem very foreign to us today for some of the customs of that time. And I'd like for you to imagine yourself being invited to a dinner party at one of the neighbor's homes. Maybe a neighbor living about a quarter of a mile away. And after being invited there, after bathing and getting dressed, you know, we put on our shoes. Our shoes at that time were open sandals, common footwear that day. Then we set on Allen foot on the, that quarter of a mile journey, maybe on a, a dusty road to our neighbor's house. And we begin to notice the dust maybe settling on our feet as we walk along that road. And we're, when we arrive at the neighbor's house, we're greeted by, by a servant who removes our shoes. It's a custom at that time not to wear shoes in the house. And we look, we look down at our feet after bathing. We're maybe a little embarrassed because our, our feet are caked with, with dust really caked with dirt and standing there not wanting to track across the white marble floor we're a little embarrassed to, to not knowing what to do and a servant arrives carrying a pitcher of water and he asks us to sit on a bench there and pours the water into a clay vessel and begins to wash our feet in the basin and then proceeds to dry them with a towel tied around his waist you know, brethren, just over a week ago, we took part in a very similar ceremony. You know, probably in, to most in our society, this seemed very strange. I know one time we were keeping the Passover over to Charleston Civic Center. They were having some other a concert or some other event there, and we were up in the room, and this young lady asked me, why are we carrying these basins? And I said, well, we're doing a foot washing ceremony. And she yells out across, across the auditorium there, they're washing each other's feet. <laughs> but to her, it was very strange. To most in our society, it would be very strange. You know, we don't have to travel those dusty highways anymore. In the foot. So why this, why this foot washing ceremony? Why, did, why do we do that? Others would say, you know, we're no longer under bondage. We don't have to do that. So what, what is the symbolism? You know, what do we learn? You know, we find reference to the foot washing ceremony in the book of John. Let's, let's turn to John chapter 13. This is a section on the Passover beginning in verse 1. John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, verse 4, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments. Another translation said that he laid aside his robe. It would be the equivalent of the day of maybe taking off your suit jacket. After they poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. At this time, nothing unusual about the washing of the feet. Verse 6, Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do you, you know not now, but you shall know hereafter. And Peter said unto him, You shall never wash my feet. You know, in order to understand Peter's reaction to Christ wanting to wash his feet, this is something we need to understand about the common practice of foot washing. 
this actual job was given and it was considered a very menial very menial task it was considered the lowest most degrading job one could have matter of fact most people could not even hire someone to do this job it was usually left up to a slave because they had to do what they were told a slave not doing it by choice but because he had to so we begin to understand Peter's reaction to Christ wanting to wash his feet and you know this is just as foreign today born to our human nature, someone in the position of Lord and Master serving others. Times haven't changed. Here was Christ taking the part of the lowest servant, a slave doing the most degrading job in that society. Continuing verse 8, Jesus answered him, I wash you not, not, you have no part with me. You know, spiritually the symbolism was, unless we accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you know, being sim symbolically clean by the baptism, we have no part. We have no part with Christ. And Peter went on to say, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him that he, he that is washed need not, not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. You know, symbolically, once we're cleaned by the water, the total immersion, the bath at baptism, we just need that symbolic cleansing of the feet, the dirt, the sin that we've accumulated since baptism, renewing that baptismal covenant. Continuing verse 10, and you are clean, but not all, for he knew who should betray him. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, know you what I've done to you? You call me Lord, or Master and Lord, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I've done unto you. You know, these are pl pretty plain biblical instructions that most, most choose to ignore. You know, Christ is telling us that we need to follow, follow that example. It makes us realize we think about there's a lot more involved in foot washing than simply washing and drying someone else's feet you know when we kneel down we're placing ourselves in a position of a servant we're saying we're someone who is willing to serve the whole household of God that we're willing to serve all the brethren You know, no matter what we're given to do to serve in the church, it really shouldn't matter. No job should be too menial or too small for us. And God is showing, or Christ was showing, that the servant doesn't have to be the so-called important jobs. That's, that's Satan's world. That's his society, working your way up the ladder. You know, we don't have to be in the limelight to serve. You know, Christ is impressed with the foot washing attitude of humble service no matter what job we're doing and Christ has shown us by this example how far he was willing to go to humble himself as the lowest of servants humbling ourselves so that we can be reconciled to God serving willing to lay down his life for each of us You know, in order to follow the example of Christ, we need to be willing to wash all the disciples' feet, though that would be impractical. You know, when we wash that one person's feet, we're washing all the feet of the brethren. We're saying that we've eliminated any animosities, grudges, wrong feelings that we might have toward another not just that person's feet there we're washing but we're saying we're willing to wash anyone's feet you know by the following example of Christ we're saying we need to be reconciled we need to be reconciled to our brothers and sisters as Jesus Christ has reconciled us to the Heavenly Father you know we can see from the foot washing 
foot washing was vital before we moved to the next step in the Passover, moving on to the bread and the wine. In order to be reconciled with God, we had to first be willing to be reconciled to our brothers and sisters, be reconciled with our neighbor. You know, and God tells us in order to have forgiveness from him, we must, we must forgive others. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 14. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours, your trespasses. Brethren, these are very, these are very strong words. You know, if we're unwilling to forgive others, then he's telling us we simply cannot be forgiven. And from this, I hope we can see how really important the foot washing ceremony really is. It has to be done before we can proceed to the next two steps, the bread and the wine. You know, none of us were there to witness the Roman soldiers when they whipped and beat on Jesus Christ. But we do know from the written word of, of God in the instruction book, it tells us a little of what happened. And the prophet Isaiah, King David, and the Psalms and the Gospel writers all bear witness to the cruel punishment that was inflicted upon Jesus Christ. You know, from these biblical accounts and also from uh, the Roman accounts of such punishments, we can understand as much as human beings can the extent of suffering our Savior went through. And you know when the authorities led Jesus Christ before the high priest and in front of the scribes and the elders, you know, he was falsely accused of blasphemy. Brethren, the religious leaders spit in his face, slapped him and beat him with their fist. And they were there to make fun of him. Then they turned to Jesus Christ over to the Romans for scourging. And they called this scourging, the, this type of punishment, the halfway death, because it stopped short, just stopped short of killing the victim. And the unleavened bread Jesus Christ gave his followers that night, he said represented his body and the apostle uh, Paul or Peter later recounted what that meant. Writing that we as Christians should follow in the steps of our Savior. And he, he said, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. You know, again, looking at the symbolism of the wine, we find the mob was there screaming. They were there screaming for his death. And the man in charge, the man in charge couldn't find no wrong in this man. And he became frustrated and he offered the mob a choice. And it was the custom at that time to release someone at the Passover. And Pilate knew that this man was totally innocent. And he gave this angry mob a choice between Jesus Christ and a man named Bar Barabbas. And Pilate probably knew that he thought that they'd probably let Christ go because Barabbas was a, was a really a, a, a bad guy at that time. He led an insurrection which caused the death of many of the Jews. So he thought naturally they'd want to see Barabbas get what was due him. But when given the choice, when given the choice, the crowd cried out, not this man, 
but free Barabbas. Then the account goes, Pilate had Christ beaten and scourged. At that time, the Romans had such contempt for the Jews. We find they dressed Christ in a purple king's robe and jammed a crown of thorns on his head. Then a few hours later, he would be dead. He would be dead after a Roman spear was thrust into his side, spilling his blood on the ground. You know, every time I read this story, I get, I get so involved in this story. The tremendous suffering, the tremendous suffering of an innocent man. And I think in my own mind's eye that sometimes this time, as I read this story, it's going to turn out different. That these people are going to realize the terrible injustice that was being done and free the right man. And you know, I become angry with the crowd demanding the blood of an innocent man. Then I come back to reality of what has really happened. The, rea real the realization hits home. It's a humbling experience, brethren, to realize that I am this man, Barabbas. That is me that has been rescued from the death penalty the penalty for me has been removed. What I deserved has been removed. Taken and borne by one who is completely innocent of any wrongdoing. And to realize I was part of that crowd, I was part of that crowd demanding the death of Jesus Christ. I was part of that crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him. It was really me ramming that spear into his side. But you know, then to realize that, and be, we can also be encouraged. We can be encouraged as we leave the Passover ceremony the service to begin to realize the tremendous price, the tremendous price that was paid for us. The price, the death of our Creator. And you know, to come to the realization that we have such a loving Father who was willing to pay that price for us. And brethren, we need to realize that he is also one that will not, he will not give up on us. He is a finisher of what he starts. And you know, as we go through this, these accounts, we begin to realize how very expensive the Passover really is, which brings us to the fourth point. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. You know, each year as we go through this physical reenactment of the holy days, and if we don't do this, if we don't do this, then these days will lose their spiritual meaning. You know, I've seen those who had a greater spiritual understanding than I ever will, who afterwards decide they did not need to obey they did not need to obey God, that the holy days and the Sabbath were no longer necessary. I've heard them called bondage, oppressive. And I've talked to the, some of these same people today, and brethren, they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue about the spiritual. They become like everyone else following the traditions of this world. They're mixed up. They're confused. They're confused just like the rest of this world. And probably some of them were out this past Sunday, this past Sunday morning, doing what Ezekiel 8 tells us not to do. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. You know, if you don't obey God, then you become confused. And you become just like the world that we came out of. You know, if we're not moving forward, we're moving backwards. We don't stand still, we start to move back. If we do stand still, we start to move backwards. Ezekiel 8, 13. Ezekiel 8, 13. He said also unto me, Turn thee again, and you shall see greater abominations than they do. 
And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple, but between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? Brethren, this is like a similar event that took place at sunrise last Sunday. You know, but not keeping the holy days, it, it becomes almost impossible, impossible to understand the scriptures. You know, if people had an understanding of the holy days, you know, there wouldn't be all this confusion about the events of Christ's death and his resurrection. You may have heard about days like Maudie, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, bunny rabbits, colored eggs. You know, days and events that are not even mentioned in the Bible. I'd, I'd never heard of this Monday, Thursday until recently. And I thought my sister was saying Monday, Monday, Thursday. I asked her what that was, and she said it was Monday, not Monday. And it was the Last Supper, and since Christ died on Friday, it's celebrated on Thursday. Thursday night before he died. And I never did find out why Friday was called Good Friday. You know, with the understanding of the holy days, it can be seen that these Mon Monday Thursdays and Good Fridays and Easter Sundays, all of these are just so much, when you look at it, there's just so much confusion. You know, we know from the history that the year Christ died, it was on a, on a Wednesday. So on Thursday, on Tuesday night, Christ kept the Passover. And as we go through the scriptures, you know, with an understanding of the Holy Days, we can see the time frame of these events. Let's begin in John 19.30. John chapter 19. Like I said, that year Christ kept the Passover on, on a Tuesday evening. Then Christ died on a Wednesday the daylight portion of the Passover. So on Wednesday that year in verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said it's finished, and bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. Verse 34, 31, Therefore, because it was a preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, in parentheses, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that his legs might that their legs might be broken, they might be taken away. So the preparation day was on a Wednesday that year before the annual Sabbath or the first day of unleavened bread. So the first holy day that year was on a, on a Thursday. You know, in verse 31, it said that that Sabbath, he was murdered, was a high day. It was an annual Sabbath. And, you know, people who don't understand and keep the holy days... When they see the word Sabbath, they assumed it was a, it was a weekly Sabbath. And by assuming, by assuming that, then Saturday, the weekly Sabbath, they ignored this statement about being a high day. They don't even know what that means. They assumed that Christ died on a Friday. So they assumed that the Passover took place on Thursday night. We see all this confusion, one, one mistake leading to another. But the script, scriptures show after putting him in the tomb before sunset on Wednesday, the women rested on Thursday, the holy day. Then on Friday morning, the women returned, as we see in Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 53. Or 55. 23, verse 55. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed, they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. On Friday, they prepared these spices and rested on the Sabbath. And they, attended, and they intended to take these spices back on Sunday morning. And on Sunday morning in Luke 24, 1, they got there early Sunday morning before sunrise, before the sun came up, while it's still dark. 
verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, Count John states it was still dark, they and certain other women with him came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in and did not find the body of Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this. And behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. He was already gone, just like he said he would be. Three days and three nights from Wednesday, he had risen on, on Saturday evening, as he had stated. You know, he said this was the proof of him being the Messiah, being three days and three nights in the tomb. You know, those who have all these worldly ideas about Easter, Maundy, Maundy Thursday, Easter Sunday, they had no biblical answer for these three days and three nights. And I know those who have rejected the holy days have gone back to this confusion, all this confusion of the world. Days and names that are not even mentioned in the Bible. You know, without understanding the holy days, these events become cloudy and confused. Brethren, if we don't use it, we lose it. Which brings us to point number five. Nature abhors a vacuum. Nature dislikes a vacuum. You know, with the Passover marking the forgiveness of our sins, symbolically removing of leading from our lives, cleaning us up, washing us clean. But like I said, nature abhors a vacuum. When something is removed, that empty space has to be filled up. It's going to be filled up with something else. So brethren, when the leavening is removed from our lives, that void is going to be filled with something. Let's look in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, we find that that void can be filled with something good, or it can be filled with something bad. Luke chapter 11. Eleven verse 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept, put in order, all cleaned up. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Brethren, this shows us if that void, if that void is not filled with the right thing, we could be much worse off than when we started. But you know from our knowledge of the days of unleavened bread, you know, in our homes we had to re we replace the leavened bread. You know, we, we replace it with the unleavened, the unleavened bread. And we know in our spiritual lives that God gives us something very positive to fill that void. And if we do nothing, if we do nothing, it's going to be filled by the ruler of this world. It was almost a year before Christ died that he brought out this concept about unleavened bread. And when we read this account in the sixth chapter of John, and we'll be finishing up here in John, and he pointed out contrary to popular belief that Moses had not given the people manna but it was God. God had done so. God had provided the manna. It wasn't Moses. John chapter 6, verse 33. 6.33. <clears throat> For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Always. 
they were still looking they were still looking for that physical manna looking at their immediate needs because they were still hungry verse 36 but I said to you that you've seen me and yet you do not believe all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me this is the will of the father who sent me that all he's given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day and this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him raise him up in the last day brethren what beautiful what beautiful encouraging words you know Jesus did not intend to supply physical bread through a miracle the miracle the miracle had already been performed Christ Christ was the manna he was the unleavened bread from heaven he supplied himself he was the unleavened bread it was Jesus not some miracle he performed which was God's miraculous sign verse 48 I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. You know, just as a physical man, I gave life to the children of Israel in the wilderness. This spiritual manna, this unleavened spiritual bread, would give eternal life, what Christ was saying. And brethren, by making Christ a part of us, this eternal life would be imparted in us. By ingesting the word in our Bible study, by that communication, that contact through prayer, by drawing near, by fasting, We'll, we'll, be taking in, we'll be taking in that unleavened bread, unleavened spiritual bread. Verse 57. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. He feeds, me, feeds on me, will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Brethren, we have to eat the unleavened bread to replace the leavening that was, that was removed in our lives. Spiritually, after we are deleavened, our sins are forgiven. But brethren, we need that unleavened bread from heaven to replace the sin that was removed. You know, just as that woman who was taken in adultery, Christ told her her sins were forgiven but she was also told to go and sin no more. You know that unleavened bread from heaven gives us that power, the power to resist sin. So we see that nature does abhor a vacuum. You know, when we take away the sin, it has to be replaced. Hopefully it'll be replaced by the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ, living in each of us. You know, today we've seen five lessons that we can learn from the spring holy days. Number one, we have to get physical about the spiritual. Saying goodbye to leavening sin is hard and it takes time. The Passover is too expensive. Use it or lose it. Nature abhors a vacuum. Hopefully we see the answer to the question I ask in the introduction you know we don't need to feel guilty about bringing leavening back into our homes physically that's all it is it is just leavening it's not sin but spiritually we do not want to bring sin back into our lives you know this process of repentance something that we should be doing daily we need to be repeating that daily the process of examining ourselves in the light of God's word, seeing ourselves, making sure that we forgive others, and then asking 
for forgiveness for ourselves. And then fill, being filled with the unleavened bread from heaven, Jesus Christ. You know, brethren, it's not a one-time event. It's a continual process. Brethren, I hope we see there's tremendous purpose in us going through these days, these spring holy days. You know, in the deleting de de of our homes, it helps us spiritually to see the need to examine ourselves and get rid of sin. With the foot washing, the need to be, hum to be a humble servant, forgiving others, to be united, to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters, the bread and the wine, the tremendous sacrifice that was done for each of us, the forgiving of our sins and being reconciled to God. You know, the days of unleavened bread, eating of the unleavened bread, showing us that now we have access to the true manna from heaven, the spiritually spiritual unleavened bread, the power to overcome sin. Brethren, as putting all these things together, to those who overcome, God makes a very important promise. Very positive, very positive, encouraging words. Him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God.